Bad news, my friends. The Greek freak is staying in Cream City, even if he never gets a ring. Here to discuss the perhaps inevitable but still shocking news and what it means for Toronto Raptors fans, I'm Aaron Bergstrom, and this is my brother Anders. We're going to talk about all things rap... Um, wait a second. Um, Wrong podcast. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, welcome to a bonus episode of the Three Brothers Filmcast, um, where we're going to be talking about the other thing that's been filling up my Twitter feed over the past week, the second season finale of The Mandalorian. Honestly, if you guys are interested in a Raptors podcast, I probably could talk about that for several hours. I'd probably enjoy that. Mandalorian is probably a little bit more in our niche for what Three Brothers Film is. So this is a bonus episode where Anton's not here. He hasn't finished the season, but we thought we should get this conversation in before Christmas and before people forget about it because it seems like they only have a 24-hour attention span when it comes to any pop culture things. Which is insane, but... We can get to that later. Well, you know, a little bit of a nod to our first episode on Mank, which is the fact that most reviews of Mank came out in the middle of November, which makes absolutely no sense. So the so when I was trying to go and read, like, people's takes about it, I was having to, like, search through the Google archive because it, all, it had come and gone several times over in terms of discourse, and that kind of stuff is just infuriating to me. I have all kinds of criticisms of you know disney and the way they've handled star wars and things but you know what i will you have to give them they know how to like still like drum up an event like they kept the spoilers for season two of mandalorian super tight to their chest and literally until like the day that it came out of the finale episode so i suppose we should it should go without saying here if you haven't seen the complete season two We're going to get into the spoilers of uh, episode 16, episode 8 of season 2, pretty shortly here. And it was pretty stunning, so. Yeah, it's the kind of thing, like, if you've read any of our stuff on the website, you should probably understand that a few years ago, we just stopped doing spoiler warnings because we don't care. It's like, if you're spending five minutes reading on this, you should not care. But if you're gonna spend half an hour listening to us talk about an episode, you should probably watch the episode. Yeah, watch the episode. If you haven't watched it yet, go watch it. Um, but if you're listening from now on, we're assuming that you've watched Chapter 16, The Rescue. So it's all fair game. Um, exactly what you said, Anders. Disney has done for all of their corporate evil. I am impressed by the fact that they kept Baby Yoda secret during the first season launch, and I'm impressed that they kept the arrival of Luke Skywalker in the final episode, a secret throughout this entire season, especially considering that Pedro Pascal, the star who plays Mando, is a bit of a loose-lipped star. He loves blabbing, and every time he has is an interview with Jimmy Fallon or whatnot, he seems to be spilling some beans on something, whether it's this or Wonder Woman 1984, which he's the villain in. But I think they did a canny thing, which is that it seems like the thing that everybody would be buzzing about, and they predictably did, is that Boba Fett comes back in this season. And so that distracted everybody and made you assume that that was the big get from the original trilogy that you got. It's like, okay, we finally get to see Boba Fett in action. We finally get to see Tamora Morrison play this, you know, version of the character since he was Jango in in Attack of the Clones. But nope, they do a bit of Rogue One, you know, de-aging special effects and have Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker show up to rescue Grogu in a sequence that pretty obviously parallels Darth Vader's destruction of the rebel troopers in rogue one <laughs> um so let's just say let's jump off with the finale because it's the most recent thing we yeah. watched uh that you're absolutely right that it's a parallel to rogue one um i think a couple of clips i've seen online show that the editing and everything seems to be quite intentional um i think it's important to note they they there's a great moment in the episode when uh they note that it's like we're being boarded how many life forms none right the dark troopers um i've kind of loved as a you know long time star wars fan and, and someone who played the original dark forces video game seeing the dark troopers in uh this season was pretty exciting uh, and is am i just am i off I, they're totally like terminators Right. Oh, 100 like, They even aped the Stan Will, uh, Winston herky-jerky movements. It's almost like the way that the Dark Troopers are animated is meant to be a homage to 1980s animation. Like, it's that's one of the things I think I appreciate most about the Disney take on Star Wars is they try really hard 
to make the presentation of the special effects fit in with the original trilogy, even if they're using technology that's way more advanced, they want it to seem of a piece. So you get, you know, the fact that the Dark Troopers are extremely advanced CGI, but then the way they move and just the rhythm of it seems to be from that 1980s. Which was something, though, that in the video game in 1995 did as well. Like when you've I believe it's a level three of the original Dark Forces. This is how insane I am about this stuff, just to let listeners know. Um, it, the, in, it's you, level five, yeah, though, right? Well, level three, you first encounter, though, the... Uh, no, because level... Horn, right? No, because... So and, and no. Th- you go to the mining planet. A noad is the third level. Fourth oh, level, you yeah. go f- um, rescue uh, General Crix Maydeen. And then yeah, the yeah. level after and that, you mine. go to that weird mining planet where you deal with the sword, the Dark Trooper. And then the abs- the one after that, you go to the ice planet and you fight the full Dark Trooper. The full-on one, like the ones we see in yeah. this episode, yeah. But even the, the, the one in previous, the one with the sword, is like the like almost like a T-1000 without like its skeletal. He looks like that shot skeletal, at the end yeah. of the Terminator when he's had his everything melted off of him. Exactly. And he's coming out of the yeah. fire. So that's fun. I mean, it's something that the Mandalorian has done really well is making homage to other uh films film history and things like that not just star wars i mean it's one of the big critiques that you know a lot of people level that jj abrams with the force awakens and and to be fair i've come around if we're talking about exclusively the sequel trilogy as we wrote in our uh, star wars retrospective last year i've come around to liking force awakens the most of those three because it feels the most uh, kind of together, but it also, I think the, the idea that, you know, the, the line that George Lucas lifted from samurai movies, John Ford, uh, West, everything, Westerns and everything, and J.J. Abrams lifted from George Lucas, it kind of stands. Whereas Favreau and Filoni uh, and their team has definitely decided to uh, lean into the, the larger genre uh, appreciation of, Lucas and his, you know, generation of movie brats, um, and, and bring some of that in. So I, I really appreciated that. Yeah, I think that the Mandal. I, we were saying this kind of the other day when we were just chatting with Anton about general Star Wars takes when we were just testing some stuff out, and I, I made the comment kind of similar to what you just said that the sequel trilogy seems to be playing entirely within the iconography of Star Wars movies. Like, all the reference points are Star Wars movie reference points, except for maybe a few things you get in The Last Jedi, which are kind of just idiosyncratic things thrown in there. But The Mandalorian seems to be doing the thing that George Lucas is doing, which is it's set in the Star Wars universe. It's playing with those characters and those worlds of the Star Wars universe that are already established by the original trilogy and the prequels. But it's making all the filmmaking references to specifically, like, 1950s entertainment. So you would get, yeah, episode seven of this season, The Believer, where it's a wages of fear episode. Absolutely. Like when, when, yeah, when you're driving the truck and you're like, oh, I was like, oh, this is great. This is. But that's the thing. It's like, maybe it's that the, the stakes of the sequel trilogy and the sheer money put into it and the fact that they only have two hours to play in that world doesn't allow them to actually pay tribute to the kinds of stories that actually form the basis of what we love is Star Wars. So mm-hmm. the Mandalorian is finally able to do that. So you get in the first episode of the season, the Marshall, where it's playing total, it's a complete Western through and through rolls up into the town and the elephant. <laughs> exactly. Well, the casting Timothy elephant in there, you're, you're riffing on everything about justified and Deadwood and all the associations with him. And the fact that he's called the Marshall when, you know, Raylan Givens and justified is a federal Marshall, mm-hmm. but then you get the, the Jedi episode. Yeah, the Jedi is a pure samurai movie. Yeah, absolutely. From down to the design of the the, the walled city that they're attacking, right? With its Well, that opening sequence is yeah. straight out of Throne of Blood. And then the actual duels in it are very much out of Yojimbo. And that kind of slow movement um, footwork as a super yeah. important part of the fight. The fight, especially between Ahsoka and... Actually, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the command commander at the moment but and then of course uh mando his fight against michael bean is with another james cameron uh collaborator there is totally you know the quick draw western it's great so i think there's something in the episodic nature of the show that 
allows the Mandalorian to thrive is that each episode is kind of bracketed off from the next. It is able to keep the story going, but in a sense, be within that freedom of like, you know, the episode's coming back next week means that the stakes are never going to sabotage the actual story at hand. And I think that's something that the, the sequel trilogy, again, never quite gets because it seems like it has to give you everything all the time. And The Mandalorian is not playing with those stakes because it's not dealing with the Skywalkers. It's not trying to pay off a story that George Lucas promised however many years ago. Perhaps counterintuitively, it's more interesting and more engaging because the stakes of it are not so massive. And they don't feel this, I think actually is something, I mean, coming back to the fact that it's clear that uh, the Disney Lucasfilm brain trust had no overarching plan for the three sequel films. Um, to, each of the directors felt they kind of had to wrap things up to some degree within their own film. Uh, I mean, saying that two of the three directors is J.J. Abrams, but even then it's clear that had he actually made the middle film his Rise of Skywalker would have been different as well. I mean, we I don't want to just spend all our time, you know, beating that dead, that dead horse. But the I think it's also interesting then to go back to the comparison we made to uh, Rogue One, because Rogue One, again, is also the film of all the Disney films that's playing in the territory of the original trilogy and, you know, post-prequel era. And I think for a lot of people, it was satisfying for that way. And you'd have the... Ba- people interacting with the main characters from the original films. But, you know, we have Mom Mothma, we have Grand Moff Tarkin, we have Darth Vader, we have, you know, those characters. But, um, and of course, again, some Clone Wars references with Saw Gerrera. Uh, and, you know, Mandalorian, we have Ahsoka Tano. It so- sounds silly to make a, a comparison to my review of Pokemon Detective Pikachu, but I'm going to do it right now. And it's the fact that Pokemon Detective Pikachu was a movie that understood that Pokemon fans are going to get more out of this movie than casual viewers, but it did not rest the importance of the movie on people understanding every in and out The In-N-Out enriches it, but it's not what the story comes from. And I think we get a little bit lost in talking about the marvelization of the Mandalorian and the Star Wars universe when we try and make those comparisons where... Yeah, it's cool when Boba Fett shows up. It's cool that Ahsoka Tano shows up. But let's just take all the actual fan service kind of giddiness out of it. The actual structure of these stories, the narrative itself, is not hinging on them at all. It's entirely hinging on Mando and Baby Yoda or Grogu's relationship. It's hinging on this idea of this lone warrior who's trying to find his own place in the universe, trying to learn about his heritage, seemingly being contradicted with every new Mandalorian he finds, and then Mm -hmm. also trying to find his place of whether, you know, where he lies in the grand scheme of this kind of galactic conflict, which is happening, but he's on the outer rim of it, right? He's on the the periphery. And Mando, in the first season when he's introduced, he is riffing on Boba Fett iconography. But if you don't know who Boba Fett is, it's not like Mando ceases to be interesting as a character because the show puts the work in to allow you to understand his tics, allow you to understand his growth as a character, and allow you to understand why he cares about Grogu. And the same thing with Grogu. He's re- riffing on Yoda. He's adorable because he's a baby version of Yoda. Yeah. But you don't have to know who Yoda is to care about the relationship between him and Mando, no. which is why I find the finale so good because... Luke Skywalker showing up is amazing. The Dark Troopers showing up is 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 very satisfying to somebody who played Dark Forces. But the moment that makes the whole episode hinge is when Mando takes off his mask, breaks mm-hmm. a rule that he has established for himself, and connects with this foster child of his. And it's like, that is the show in a nutshell. Yeah, that to me is the uh, the emotional crux of both seasons. Like, it, it gets to that point. And I have to admit, it was like... I was emotionally moved. <laughs> like, how could you, like, I was welling up. I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah, it might be like, it might be a little silly, right, to think about. Yeah. Grogu's not there. He's not, phys- like, he, he's a puppet in some scenes, but in the moment, he, that moment, he's CGI augmented. And yet, 
you know Pedro Pascal's not playing to anything in that moment, if you actually like intellectualize it. But because we've watched these 16 episodes that have deepened this relationship, because we understand where this character is coming from, and we understand the ways that they've kind of ingratiated themselves into each other, the fact that they're both outsiders and they're both extremely lonely individuals, you know, it sounds extremely simplistic maybe for me to be saying this, but I enjoy The Mandalorian precisely because it takes a conventional story structure and how to build character and how to deepen it and how to pay it off. And it, it just and does that. Exactly. It does the conventional extremely well, which makes perfect sense for a show that is aimed at the broadest possible audience. Which is really what Star Wars did in the original 1977 film. It's like, we're going to take these, you know, fairy tale conventions, these, you know, classic adventure movie cliches, but we're just going to do it really, really well. Yeah, it's the idea of archetypes. Archetypes are, I mean, it's almost... I almost hate using the word because it's been so degraded over the years. Even if nobody or very few people nowadays really know anything about Joseph Campbell, but you get kind of this discussion of archetypes are good or bad and it's a binary as opposed to archetypes are just a foundation that has been there for so long. And so it clearly is a type of story element that works very well on us. And it makes perfect sense for something like star Wars, which is the most popular film franchise of all time to be playing entirely in that really broad well of of hero stories and myth and in this sense it makes sense to be playing in the the sandbox of westerns which is the defining american myth and samurai movies which is the kind of stylistic most important influence on star wars as a, as a franchise and so combining those things and turning it into an episodic tv show where we follow this kind of you know, he's he's not m- uncomplicatedly morally good, but th- he's the classic, like, outsider with a strict moral code. And just yeah, watching... He, yeah, he, he is like Mifuni's uh, Yojimbo a little bit. like Or some el- of some versions some of, like, elements, Clint Eastwood, yeah. you know, characters. Not not the uh, High Plains Drifter version, but... <laughs> <laughs> I The other thing I want to talk about, so, like, we've, we've talked a little bit about how Mandalorian draws on sort of larger storytelling and, and cinematic issues but then we can talk about how it fits into star wars as a cinematic storytelling thing and the connections and relations there we you know we can talk about it in terms of fan service but you can also talk about it in terms of what it's doing um in terms of filling in some of those gaps and i think one of the things mandalorian really is satisfying and one of the reasons why the luke skywalker moment at the end of uh the episode eight season two is so powerful is that what everyone really always wanted was what happens after return of the jedi right not 30 years later not 40 years later but like what further adventures of luke post jedi and this is the closest we we get to seeing like this is what five years after return of the jedi yeah. luke's obviously thinking about establishing a you know jedi training academy and you know when i have to admit part of me was like when in uh the episode uh six the tragedy when grogu is meditating on that rock and he's you know communicating communicating with some jedi i was like well it's obviously luke skywalker who else well, he's already talked to ahsoka so who else exists right yeah some people are being like oh it's gonna be it's gonna be ben solo or it's gonna be ezra the main character for rebels and it's like isn't ben like two years old yeah (laughs) maybe if he even exists then but it's also like stop overthinking it who the return of the jedi means like yeah we know there's a soak in the background there's a few peripheral jedi out there because even she's consciously rejected the jedi order exactly but luke is the jedi at this moment He's communing with the Jedi. Let's not ever overthink this. And because it's a TV show, I think, even though nowadays film, TV, it's so impossible to determine, The Mandalorian probably has a higher budget than 95% of all things that would have hit screen this year, like the theaters this year. But I think they play in... It's surprising because they play into the expected thing and because they know that we're all kind of savvy audiences and we're going to assume that it's not going to play to the expected and they're going to, it's going to zag. And it's like, they know that we're not going to just give them what they really want, which is Luke Skywalker. So we're going to give them Luke Skywalker. And it's actually like baseball. It's like you've, 
it's like a pitcher like making the batter triple think and then you're just going to send that fastball straight down the middle exactly you're making them overthink and it blows by them and the hair goes flying back and you know and maybe it's extremely manipulative or it's it's indicative of how manipulative disney is to compare the relationship between them and their audience as a pitcher and a batter (laughs) in a baseball game but i think it's accurate because they really do think about the star wars fan at the front of everything and for better and worse that is what they've been trying to give people since they purchased it from lucas and i just think that in terms of threading that needle between fan service and strong original storytelling between playing in the all in the sandbox that's been established already and expanding that sandbox the mandalorian is probably the best example of that that they've done so far i think it's like i speaking as a parent and watching so i've been watching the mandalorian each week over the last two years when it comes out we watch it friday night it's the only mo- t- in, in a TV you know universe that's been divided up by streaming, uh, and everyone has their own profile on their various uh, accounts and things. Mandalorian is the like only sort of throwback in our family to like the old gather around the TV, all generations, you know, parents and kids all watch together, and so that's been really exciting. Like the the kids, that's all they can talk about after, right? And I have to say, this season, like, delivered hugely. And not only in terms of, like, because satisfying some sort of fan service thing, but, like, their imaginations, like, actually blown wild open. They were, like, when, when that X-Wing pulled in, they were, like, oh, it's Luke, right? The excitement was so big. But now they're also thinking about, okay, so what's going to happen? Is Grogu going to go off with Luke? What's going to happen with, you know, Mando now, you know? Uh it really has succeeded as a show that uh, has fueled my kids' interest in Star Wars in a way that, the, as much as they like the other new films and stuff, this one is the one that they've connected the most with. Yeah, and I think it because it has a bit of that that open and element of it, because you know Mando is a character who never shows up in the other ones. Because it's even though Luke Skywalker has entered this story, we know that it's not about Luke Skywalker. It's about these people on the periphery. And within that um, limitation of the character, this character is not going to affect the entire galaxy. There's actually a huge amount of freedom, and with that freedom comes a huge amount of mystery. And I think what you were saying about sitting down with your kids and watching it kind of hits on why I find... Star Wars so special still in this modern age which is that it's truly the all ages entertainment that we can all enjoy like Game of Thrones was the show (laughs) that everybody in you know who had any interest in pop culture everybody watched it weekly it was the thing I talked about at work with Mm -hmm. everybody but it's not kid friendly it is not a thing you would sit down with your kid ever and I know my parents right that too a certain type of viewer you know, of a certain age might not be into it. And I think there's kind of this um, casual dismissal that certain so-called savvy um, consumers of entertainment have nowadays where they're like, I don't want something dumbing it down for the kids, or I don't want it washing out the things so the people with their delicate sensibilities aren't going to be offended by it. I want things that are just smart and good and, and, and adult and complex as if those are, synonyms and Mm -hmm. the thing that anybody who likes star wars should understand intrinsically is that there's a type of entertainment that is broad and complex and appeals to all ages without being childish and there's a space for that right now and i think there's especially a space for that right now when we all feel so disconnected in terms of entertainment where there's nothing there really is nothing that's unifying us all because there's no communal spaces anymore Mm -hmm. and it sounds silly to talk about a tv show as as unifying in that sense but i i appreciate that it's just something that whether i'm talking to yeah my nephews or i'm talking to people co-workers at work who are 20 years older than me there seems to be a shared at least cultural interest in star wars that transcends these kind of boundaries and i think mandalorian is the the one product from disney that has bridged that the best if that makes any sense 
Yeah, I think so. Um, so just quick question before, so I think there are a few throw a few things off before we wrap it up. Um, mm-hmm. just quickly, like, what's your favorite episode of the season? Well, the f- the finale is hard to beat because, uh, you know, as a old expanded universe fan from like the pre time before the prequels and everything it's pretty great to see luke skywalker in a sort of expanded universe story but in terms of just sheer filmmaking and everything i think episode five the jedi is my favorite like but i also like the first episode with (laughs) cobb vamp too uh so ah, it's hard to pick between those one of those three is probably my favorite but yeah it's i mean maybe it's a bit of a um a bounty in terms of this season because if i want that kind of easygoing monster of the week vibe the first episode just hits it so well where you have that amazing guest star you have a great monster to fight you have really good production values and the build of actually getting to that showdown with the crate dragon is just really satisfying if i'm going for an individual moment in the show that calls back to the original trilogy episode six uh the tragedy where it's this kind of quiet wide shot of slave one showing up in the sky mm-hmm. over top of uh, Grogu and Mando on top of the Jedi temple. And it's, it's one of those things that it's probably Pierce fan service because if you don't understand what slave one is, you're not going to understand the like chills that that sends. But it's broad enough that if you've seen Empire Strikes Back, you should recognize this shit. Right? No, like... it's, it's true, but it, there's, there, it's just, I love how matter of fact it is. And I love how mm-hmm. it builds that into it where Mando knows it's like a villain coming or a adversary coming, but he doesn't know it's Boba Fett. Yeah. Because he's I, like the people who don't get it, right? <laughs> can we talk for just a minute or two about like the way it, Boba Fett has been brought back in this and how it could have been disastrous, but I think they played it really well. That he's neither a straight villain. I mean, remember, this is a guy who has, you know, literally worked with Darth Vader to hunt down Han Solo and trade him into job of the hut he's not a good guy yeah but he's a bounty hunter. but at the same time he's a bounty hunter he just goes where the money is right and he has this connection to the mandalorian armor but it's a personal connection it's not a religious connection and i think he's like the, the interesting if you have all these mandalorians who have their different relationships with mandalorian culture or you know and things you have you know bo katan and the sort of mainstream political mandalorian establishment you have Mando, who he's discovering actually that he was raised in some sort of, you know, cultish sect that has non-conventional beliefs, and he's having to reconcile that. And then you have, uh, you know, Boba, who, you know, his his connection to the Mandalorians is kind of familial, right? It's, but it's but he's not a, a adherent to. Well, and as you get in the rescue, they don't even some of the other mandalorians don't even consider him a real mandalorian they just exactly. dismiss him as a clone which and is kind of offensive too <laughs> it is and but it makes him an outsider within outsiders yeah which is why there's an inherent interest and of course seeing him then, just demolish those stormtroopers is super satisfying because we get to see the boba fett we've always heard yeah. about and then should we talk about the post credits teaser what so the book of boba fett what is this? i've is been a- wanting a strict a straight look at kind of scum and villainy within the Star Wars universe for a while. And so it excites me, the idea of the universe, uh, a show where Boba Fett can be traversing through the Hut universe mm-hmm. and maybe, you know, maybe Prince Shizor shows up, maybe some other maybe, characters from... They go to Narshada, you know. Like. Yeah, just all this stuff from the expanded universe or things that like Solo, a Star Wars story, hinted at but never really yeah. delved into that much. So I'm, I'm, I'm totally down. I thought that the second they introduced boba again and they're not gonna get they're not gonna (laughs) (laughs) they're not gonna get rid of boba fett right like you introduce him he's in for the long haul because he's so popular but Mm -hmm. i'm also i'm of the perhaps uh controversial opinion that jango fett is way cooler than boba there's no question because he fights a jedi and kind of holds his own when he's fighting obi on kamino and tomorrow morrison is so cool as jango fett so i'm very down for tomorrow morrison to get the chance to like be a lead character in a tv show because he's just an actor i've liked even outside of star wars for a long time yeah. any final thoughts on mandalorian or star wars where we're at right now obviously they announced all those tv shows coming for star wars and i i made this comment to i think a you and, and several others that if i am mentally 
taking these new TV shows as just expanded universe things, kind of similar to like back in the 90s, we would have the books or the comics. Mm -hmm. Now we have TV shows and you don't have to treat it all like this is the be all and end all of the Star Wars universe or even something you have to engage with. Just engage with it if it's interesting or if it, you know, there's something about it that piques your, uh, your interest or just seems to be like drawing into the larger story. And so in one sense, the f- sheer volume of them is kind of scary as a person who wants to be a Star Wars completist. Yeah. But I just don't think I can be a completist anymore. And If I take that opinion, then I'll be like, okay, there's a few things here that sound interesting and the others, who cares? Same. It, I find it kind of freeing in a sense. So that, you know, the two ways you can be freed is either by it stopping or, you know, by being like, okay, I know there's no way that I can ha- take in everything. So, you know, I'll just engage with what I want to. And of course, you know, things like Obi-Wan by teasing the fact that Hayden Christensen's coming back. Uh, you know, I'll definitely be tuning into some of that stuff. Some of the others, we'll see. We'll see what happens. There's not going to be any lack of Star Wars in upcoming years. And that'll no. probably make us get a little bit bored with it, maybe. But who knows? The Ma- I thought that the Mandalorian wasn't going to hook me to the degree it did, and it did. So credit to yeah. them. That, I think, wraps it up for this uh, bonus episode of Three Brothers Filmcast. Um, let us know in the comments what you think about The Mandalorian or about the episode. Uh, subscribe, share, you know, read our writing on the website. That's still the bulk of what we, what we do. And there's going to be some more Christmas stuff available once this episode's live. So please check into that and be on the lookout for our yearly roundup lists coming in the early new year. So thanks for listening. Show me the one whose safety deemed such destruction. You must reunite it with its own kind. Where? This you must determine. The songs of eons past tell of battles between Mandalore the Great and an order of sorcerers called Jedi. You expect me to search the galaxy and deliver this creature to a race of enemy sorcerers? This is the way.